so in summary, video games are much more than solo entertainment these days. It's not just about playing the games now, it's about consuming them as, as media. You're watching for skill, strategy, and competition, much as you would watch sports or other entertainment. And multiplayer games really are where the magic is. Uh, any, everything from StarCraft II to, to, to Counter-Strike to Tribes, it's, it's all about multiplayer. And the, the key difference, though, is that it has to be easy to spectate. But long story short, millions of people watching games equal spectator enter entertainment. I think we're pretty much there. Um, again, it's not just about esports. People are watching all types of video gameplay content, live, VOD, um, and it's, uh, it, it's constantly growing. So now we'll, uh, we'll open it up for uh, Q&A. There's a mic here if anybody wants to queue up. Hello. Sir? So I have a question for the panel. Uh, recently, uh, Guild Wars 2 has been uh, announced as they're pushing for an eSport aspect to it, but they've also announced that they're not launching with a spectator mode. And there's been a question in the community as to whether that was going to kill the potential eSport viability of it. And other people point to League of Legends and say, it didn't start with a spectator mode, but look how popular it is today. What do you guys think? Is League of Legends the exception to the rule, or does it prove that that's viable? Sure. Uh, Welcome to Record yeah, Phone, uh, uh, the easiest... <laughs> I mean, League of Legends, I'm glad you brought it up, uh, because that is the exception to the rule, right? Because everyone said, well, you have to have spectator mode if you want to actually be a, a competitive game. Um, so, I guess with that being said, I think that there's hope. I mean, let's remember, Guild Wars didn't originally have a spectator client either. Um, it took quite a while before it was actually implemented into the game by ArenaNet. And so, I believe, due to the success of that, even though it was limited, they have it in their plans. Whereas, I feel like Riot was almost pressured into it, and maybe wasn't quite ready to do that. Of course, they've done amazing things with that, for sure. Um, but, um, you know, I, I'm not quite sure that you can say that it, it, it could kill it yet. You know, one thing, and actually I would love to like do a reverse, you know, role reversal here and ask these guys a question because I wonder if there's ever any pushback from the developers to say, well, if people are streaming, why do we need a spectator mode anyway? Um, but in actuality, of course, to conduct the turn. Yes, welcome one, welcome all this week on Tales of Tyria. We've got the PAX East recap. We've got a ton of interesting information, including a blog post about squads. And we've got a little bit of a recap from last week about the World of Warcraft feedback. It's coming to you. Yes, welcome one, welcome all. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. I know we're starting a little bit late today, and I apologize for that, but just got back from the back of the PAX East. The PAX East, it was awesome. Great and I are going to be talking to you about that in just a moment, but let me introduce you to the show, because this is, in fact, Tales of Tyria, Guild Wars 2 podcast right here on the Sound Strategy Network. If you're new to us, you can find us at talesoftyria.com. And uh, we have a lot of great stuff to talk about today, and we've got a lot of great people, so let's introduce them. Uh, to my left, if you're watching the stream here, we've got Freelancer. Hello, sir. That's your other left. My other, to my, I've got it mirrored <laughs> on my screen. Dang it. How's it going? Uh, how's it going, Bridger? Didn't see you at so, PAX East. How late were you up at PAX East? We, we, we rocked it all night long until we left at 10.30 and 11. <laughs> into the concert. Well, Have you, you know, not we heard of five-hour energy drinks? I hate those things because they're not <laughs> actually five-hour energy, but that's, this isn't a science podcast. Let's just get into that another time. Uh, also joining us, we have Great, who was at PAX East. He was, uh, you were there for your website, right? What's your, what's your website? 
Uh, yeah, I do writing for <clears throat> a video game website called uh, PsychoButtons.com. So just PsychoButtons.com. And uh, yeah, I actually had to work all weekend, but it was still amazing. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. You got to work while being at PAX. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They paid for you to go to PAX. Yeah, pretty much. I had to cover a lot of expenses, but still, I got to go to PAX and get work done. I have no words for what I just heard. Well, you I tried to yet. pull them away to do cool <laughs> things. I, didn't, I wasn't wanna. paid, like, with money. They just helped pay his way. It's as if he was <laughs> yeah. an enforcer, but instead he was enforcing the truth. All right, also with us the here, <laughs> we've got Vega, which has gone super pixelated again, I man. Need to, I need to reset my webcam again because I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to reset it right You're now. You're in 8-bit mode, I think. That's, that's it, 8-bit mode. Can I leave Skype and call you back? Yeah, we'll get back to I'm you. All right, mode. okay. Oh. So, uh, I just want to point out here, because this is going to be a very exciting set of weeks for you fans out there watching Tales of Tyria, because we have... Let's see, this is this is some special keys for some special things for this MMORTS call now called Noveris, Noveris Eterno. I've got uh, one year of free Kaspersky internet security if you need that for some reason. <laughs> um, tribes gold, 250 free tribes gold for, what do you got, five, six people here. I've got so many Monday night combat skins, special PAX versions, <laughs> I can't even fit them in my hand. Um, oh, and one other thing. Guild Wars 2 beta keys. hey -oh! uh, And I gotta tell you this story, because this is the best story that ever happened. Uh, apparently, I mean, I knew that uh, Martin Kirstein was gonna be there, as well as uh, John Peters, and I think Regina was walking around there at some point, too. She I didn't was. see them. Uh, but I did catch up with Martin. And I saw him, and I said, oh, Martin, hey! I'm Bridger from Tales of Tyria and Team Legacy. I have a Team Legacy shirt on. Feyrana had her Team Legacy shirt on. Killy was there. And I was like, oh, man, we can't wait to, yeah, blah, blah, you watch the show? And he's like, I don't have time for podcasts. And I was like, oh, <laughs> well, anyway, uh, you know, he, oh, he's like, oh, Team Legacy, you're the complainers. And I was like, what are you talking about? Because not 10 minutes earlier, he had tweeted that he was giving away these beta keys to people that had attended his panel. And I had misdirected the time. It was actually on Friday, and I thought it was going to be on Saturday. And so, Ors got on the Team Legacy net after having seen that they were giving away beta keys, and he typed, not fair, Martin. Not fair at all. And <laughs> I so, remember that. I was talking to him. And then Martin um, saw me, and he's like, oh, you're the guys complaining about the beta keys. Well, how big's your guild? I said 100. He's like, well, here, take these. And he handed me just a handful. So I got it's like It's not 12. safe to go alone. Uh, yeah. But... And I was so excited. I was like, holy crap! And then I went to the other side and it said, on April 10th, you can fill these in. And it became very clear that these are simply keys, the same kinds of keys that will get you into the same things as if you pre-purchase the game. So it's nothing special. However, I know that probably, at least I know a couple of people that are probably going to be very interested in Guild Wars 2, uh, and, but not necessarily interested enough to pre-purchase it, but still want to try it out. So that's what these are great for. You can give them to your friends and say, try this out because it's awesome and get them hooked onto it. So I'm going to keep one for me and my friends i'm gonna give one to team legacy and then i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna like sort of raffle off the rest of these uh, two you know, to people i don't on, think uh, there's a soul in team legacy that is a pre-purchase thing so well that's what i'm saying they, they might have friends though so i'm gonna save a yeah, couple for point. people that might have some friends that are interested but i will give out six of them to our audience members great i know had a couple as well uh so maybe we can yep. cajole him into giving his up to uh and then we'll have tons of stuff so what we're gonna try to do is have a bunch of prizes and content Tests and stuff over the next couple weeks on Tales of Tyria and give away all this crazy stuff uh, because I really don't have a use for it. Oh, I've also got Sivir uh, and skins and things like that for... Oh, there we go. we got Sivir and we've got uh, Nasus and so that, that's cool for League of Legends. Anyway, back to the Guild Wars 2 here. What I wanted to let everybody in on is... Uh, thanks. Actually, I need to go and find out because there's a couple of people that donated in the last couple weeks and I don't have your names because I'm pulling everything together at the last second. However, I'm not asking anybody to donate this week. This is not a, this is a non-donation week. If you want to help the show, what you can do is subscribe to us on YouTube because if we get up to 5,000, then we're going to potentially have the option to get a partnership and that would give us tools to make the whole channel a lot easier and cleaner to use and understand and group everything by show and it just gives us a lot of great tools to do with that. So, uh, if anybody out there is watching and is not subscribed, 
I would appreciate it if you did. If you don't want to and you say, screw you, you're selling out, blah, 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 don't subscribe. I don't care. All right? This is, this is only for people that want to help the show. I'm not, I'm not going to spend like a minute and a half. On, oh, okay. Let's move on. So this week had uh, a lot of uh, great stuff happening. And uh, now actually... Let's 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 back up to PAX a little bit and give a little bit more info there. Great, you went to the panel, the future of online gaming. That had John Peters, right? From yeah, Guild, he was from there. Internet. And a huge assortment of people from like all the big MMOs that are coming out this year. So, and, did uh, you see anything there, Guild Wars Two related, that was really intriguing or interesting? I heard they put some new footage in there. Yeah, they actually did. What what, what happened was, um, we they did the panel, which was amazing. And these guys are all, like, coming from different areas. Like, MMOs are going crazy right now. But after, like, right after the panel ended, they said, hey, wait around. You know, John Peters has something to show everyone. And the lights, you know, dim down and it's on the stage. And this, the, the, the cameras go on, and it's Guild Wars 2. He's playing a thief, I guess. And it was footage. And he said, yeah, guys, you know, this is Guild Wars 2. He's explaining, you know, the usual go-through, like they do at all the conventions and stuff. And then what he does... Is he says something to the? He basically says that yeah, I was bringing Guild Wars 2 over to play live here at this after this panel, but my computer broke on the way over, <laughs> so I couldn't do it live. So we had to film this at like the last second, and <laughs> biggest surprise, like everyone started going crazy. He said, oh yeah, one more thing. When you guys walk out of here, you're all getting beta keys for coming to the panel. And everyone went crazy. I, I mean, that literally made the whole night for me. I got to talk with John Peters. I got to say hello to Martin. It was really, really amazing. Tell them about your revolving door scheme. Oh, <laughs> I don't really want to talk about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. I have to hear this. What is this I, revolving? I so, it. technically, you're only supposed to get one of these. <laughs> it has three codes on them. I have three. Because <laughs> he walked and, back in under the auspices of going to find John Peters. Well, and then, oh, I, I can't I, find him. And he walked back out and they handed him another one. <laughs> no, oh, I didn't expect was, this at all. I see Martin as I'm leaving and I say, hey, Martin, I met you at PAX Prime like a year ago. And I was wondering if I could do an interview because I work for the website. And I, I asked him if he wanted to do an interview or if I, could, if I could get John Peters to do an interview. And he's like, well, I'm really busy. Go talk to John, but go get your beta key first and then go back in. So I grab a beta key, I go back in to go see John. And I'm, I end up walking out with like this kind of like posse of people that's following John Peters around. And <laughs> I get handed another one as I'm leaving. So I'm like, oh, I'm getting another one. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> like, I just take them like, yeah, thank you. It's the beta keys. That's right. And, and then I kind of go back and grab another one. <laughs> because they had, they literally had a box full of beta keys. They just had like sitting on the floor. Now these these are beta keys for like after the pre-purchase, right? Yeah, it's it's basically yeah. gonna get you into either equal to or less than what pre-purchasers will get. So it's nothing to to, to write home about, but they're real, still cool to give away to people that. Oh, absolutely. Be. I mean, for those that couldn't get into uh, or do not have the money right away to buy the game, yeah, you know, definitely. Absolutely. It's for like the people, people that are on the fence. fence. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. what it's for. And PAX is a f perfect place to find those because they didn't have any other actual, uh, you know, presence there except for like that panel and one other panel that I think Martin was on that uh, that that I did not get to either because it was about starting up community websites. And I got a community website, so I don't need to learn how to start it up. Um, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I was I was doing something else. I don't remember what it was. But anyway, uh, let's see. So that that was great, and we had a Team Legacy meetup. I got some awesome footage of that, uh, and 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 there was a a, a dance central competition between Fairana and Killy. That was awesome. Team Legacy had some great times there, and uh, it, it kind of made me. And then talking with DJ Wheat was great. Uh, great, yep. and I met up with him after one of the panels, and we were talking for a while. We're trying to get him on uh, the show. We had a, a bit more of a progress in getting that to happen, so we'll hopefully see that sometime. I in actually the had a uh, I had a chance to talk to uh, In Control, mm -hmm. Jeff. Jeff is his name. I think yep. Robinson is his last name. I'm not too sure. And I asked him. I was. I actually got up in line for the Q and A for that panel because they did State of the Game live. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask him the question like, "What do you think about other like other games, kind of different types of genres getting involved in like competitive scenes, and particularly you know leading to Guild Wars 2? Mm -hmm. And I, I got a chance to you know ask him after the fact, so I didn't get to ask my question. But and he kind of said something to the extent of. It all depends on like how the game is and all that stuff. But he said something very interesting that he says the game, the community, the competitive community has to kind of support itself. It has to be very like independent. And what he means by that is like you see Riot with League of Legends, they're supporting a lot of tournaments. Like they're propping up a lot of tournaments. 
And for a good, successful community of competitive like gaming to like rise, according to Jeff, was that it needs to kind of like be independent. So we see with StarCraft, we have all these independent leagues that are not affiliated with Blizzard, like aside from sort of like support, you know, getting the game there and stuff. Blizzard isn't giving them money to, you know, have these tournaments, while Riot is. And he says that is probably one of the key things for those games, other games outside of, like, StarCraft Two and League of Legends to succeed. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I think they see, I mean, Riot, for example, would see creating these tournaments and using their cash. That's like their marketing budget, right? That's they're, they're trying to get more people yeah. to buy, to play the game, not buy it, to buy skins and buy, you know, uh, rune pages and things like that. They're trying to get more people involved and attracted, even though they've already got 35 million, they're like more. So that's, that's their marketing budget. But that, 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 I think they're probably making hand over fist on those skins and things like that. I mean, they, they, they hit the jackpot when it comes to that. Will ArenaNet have the same type of cash to throw at these type of tournaments? Well, we don't know. Maybe they're willing to do that. Maybe they're not. But I think that what Jeff said, in control has said, is, is entirely correct. That if you want a really healthy esports community, it needs to be able to stand on its own were the development to support to be, you know, in terms of monetary support, not in terms of game feature support, to disappear. Yep. You need sponsors like Intel and, and NVIDIA and what, things like that to step in. One, one of the best marketing um, schemes I ever saw was for Dota 2. No, there was very little information about it before it actually was revealed. And then the way they reveal it is with a million dollar prize pool tournament with all the old Dota teams. And they didn't really use a lot of marketing because when you do something that big, that is your marketing. So these companies spend millions of dollars on marketing for doing advertisements here and there and doing this. If you want it to be an eSport game, the best thing to do is to take that budget and instead of putting it into silly advertisements, put it into a tournament that's going to get recognized. Absolutely. Freelancer, any thoughts before we move on? Uh, I, I agree with In Control there. You've got to have that third-party support. Um, I uh, hope that uh, Guild Wars 2 gets that support. Obviously, you know, uh, just a little plug. You, you and I both know, Bridger, that Team Legacy is going to be hosting our own series of tournaments. Mm -hmm. But the really big, you know, tournaments, the ones that have the $20,000 prize pool and such, um, those are going to be critical. I would imagine ArenaNet's probably going to host one or two just to kick it off. Uh, but your your big Steel Series, you know, all, all of these big companies, TeamSpeak, obviously doing a lot in terms of StarCraft II, they're going to have to step in. And right now, nobody is. I mean, it's a little early for that, but hopefully um, come beta we'll hear about some of these big names jumping in absolutely all right so let's move on we had a, a lot of good feedback remember last week freelancer asked for your best and worst memories of world of warcraft and i <laughs> thought we'd feature one of the best emails that we got uh, and i will read it uh, quote one of my best memories from wow is from vanilla my friend had a very well geared level 60 rogue and while he was at work he allowed me to log in as a way of counter ganking my own character was a priest around level 30 or 40 and for fun i used to open up two instances of wow log into both my priest and my friend's rogue i'd set my priest to follow the rogue and then i'd switch the rogue to stealth, just walk around in hopes that somebody would try to gank my priest. Whenever someone tried, I'd decloak and absolutely destroy them. I had a ton of fun doing this around <laughs> Hillsbrad. Uh, another of my best memories was when I was doing a 2v2 with a friend, and just before the doors opened, he disconnected, leaving me thinking it wasn't even worth trying. But as a night elf, I shadow melded, and they, a holy paladin and a hunter, immediately targeted my friend, who happened to be a protection paladin, who just stood there. They were obviously confused. I was a shadow priest, so I dotted up them both, psych screamed, and ran. Then after an incredibly tense fight involving a lot of line of sighting, I began to beat them both with about 10 HP to spare. To top it off, the enemy team had a higher rating than we did and were called OMFG, pwned, lol. That was a rush. So thank you, Dark, for sending in that awesome story for us. And we definitely appreciate that. And for uh, recompense, because he didn't even know it was coming and he did it just out of the kindness of his heart after we asked for some feedback, we're going to give him something from this PAX something or other. So I'll send you an email there, Dark, and we, we'll give you your first pick off of the pile of swag that we've got from PAX here. So <laughs> that's, that's what we'll do. Maybe we'll do that each week. If we get some really the good feedback, we'll give, uh, we'll give the best feedback each week some, some awesome swag. So for that entertaining story, we appreciate it, sir. Thank you very much. 
so I think with that, we should probably not talk about World of Warcraft for another <laughs> set of <laughs> weeks episodes. Please, here. Please uh, and it looks like we lost Freelancer. I hopefully he gets back in here in a few uh -oh. moments. And uh, and <laughs> meanwhile, let's move on because frames. Speaking he, of stealth mode, <laughs> he would want us to. I'm pretty sure. Um, speaking of stealth mode, <laughs> <laughs> so. This was a fantastic suggestion. I just had to mention it on the Guild Wars 2 subreddit. Uh, somebody was talking about how the lame the finish animation is in Guild Wars 2. And what they suggested was custom animations that you could buy in the gem store. So you could buy flashy, awesome animations that didn't take any longer or shorter, but just made your character look more badass. And maybe they'd be class specific. So you could buy a special warrior one. So whenever he has a hammer, he does some really awesome thing where he throws the hammer up in the air and then catches it as it's coming down and like slams some guy, kills him, something like that. You know, so that I thought was a really cool idea. And okay, we got Freelancer popping back into the thing here. So I just had to mention that because that sounds like one of the coolest things that they could possibly put in the store. That I'd everybody... throw my money at that. Exactly. I'd throw money at the screen for that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> Take it. Can I throw my swag? Would that work? <laughs> yeah. Can I throw my beta keys? <laughs> <laughs> Take them back. <laughs> Take the beta keys back. I need, I need that awesome thing. All right. Freelance really is back. Idea. There he is. Uh, we're talking about the uh, – the, would love to see some profession-specific, custom, like, high-quality animations you could buy in the gem store. I think that's a wicked awesome idea. Say it one more time. Sorry. So Loading back in. People were complaining about the, the, the crappy animation in that, uh, that the finish animation for, uh, for PvP. We have to finish somebody off. And somebody suggested that they sell like really cool looking like class specific or even weapon specific animations in the gem store as a, as a way to make money but also do it in an aesthetic way. And I think that's a perfect example of what the community would sort of appreciate and not uh, really care too much about because there's no power advantage there. Yeah, a little aesthetic things like that would be fun. Uh, also, like taunts and stuff, kind of like what. Um, uh, obviously, you know, Super Monday Night Combat has all those custom taunts you can yes. you can uh, buy and stuff, and they all do fancy little things. I think just emotes in general uh, would be fun. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. Uh, kill animations would definitely uh, make a, a killing. <laughs> yes, they uh, would. <laughs> yeah, womp womp womp. <laughs> or hats. What about hats, guys? I love hats. <laughs> <laughs> Give me hats. Well, I mean, right. the chests are already there, so they might as well just go all out and put the hats in. There you go. All right, so <laughs> next on the list, Oceanic Servers confirmed? Question mark? This has been passed around a lot. For those of you not aware of the issue, right now we know that uh, basically – um, we know that there are going to be servers in the in, in the North American area, and there's going to be data centers in Europe, which means European players who play on European servers will actually be able to... Let me see if I can't find it here. There it is. Uh, will actually be able to connect very close to their home location. So they're going to have very good ping, either in Europe or in the United States. However, people in Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia... Or, or Japan or any of the any of the Asian uh, uh, countries there are not going to be able to connect to any ho locally hosted areas there. They're going to have to connect to the North American servers. And for some reason, and if you look at the way this question is answered, it's really weird. Um, the uh, let me see where to go. Uh, I disappeared from me. There it is. Will Guild Wars 2 have dedicated oceanic servers for customers in Australia and New England? And then they say, yes, but then they say, no. <laughs> Australian and New Zealand players <laughs> will connect to the game servers running in the U.S. That's very clear. The game servers are running in the U.S. Your ping is going to be awful. But, but don't worry, because the patch data will come from local cache servers in Australia. Yay. Okay. Wow. That is not a consolation so, prize. <laughs> but what this means is you can get into the game extra fast because we put the files local to you. Mm -hmm. But when you actually get in the game, it's going to take forever to log in. <laughs> and when so you get in the you'll game, you'll be just you at the to, same speed as everybody else. When I try to when I try to jump, it'll react in about a half a second. I mean, that's a <laughs> massive distance. The speed of light is only so fast. And so that's very disappointing, of course, to a lot of the people in, uh, in the, that would normally be on an oceanic server in Australia, New Zealand, or, or, or the Asian area countries. And that 
of course, is a business decision. ArenaNet has to decide, are there enough customers over there for us to support setting up a data center? Because those are not cheap to set up or run. And unfortunately, it looks like however they did the math, the numbers didn't work out. But maybe if there are enough, uh, you know, oceanic customers that, you know, say, well, th I bought the game, but I'm not going to buy any expansions because when I play it, it's laggy as hell. You know, so maybe if that kind of feedback gets to them, they'll, they'll change their mind. Maybe we'll see it in the future. But it seems for right now, it's a pretty solid no. You're going to have to play with a fairly laggy connection in, uh, in, over there. Yeah, most, most Oceanic um, players probably won't have that bad of a connection, though. Um, they got pretty good internet over there, believe it or not. I, that's really weird because I've heard uh, some horror stories about some places in Australia, specifically. In about... Australia, yeah. Yeah, okay. definitely. Well, everything's upside down, so it, you know. <laughs> so the internet's upside down. Is that... In Australia, <laughs> Google searches you. Wait a minute, they do that here too. <laughs> oh, I see what you did. This is just pun night, isn't it? It is. It's terrible. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, there was a post on Reddit that I linked to that I'm not entirely sure why I linked to it. So let me look here. Oh. Uh, this is actually a post by somebody who was in the beta who said, um, that the, uh, that, uh, forget about side kicking up, down, no problem, whatever, since everybody will probably be level 80 in two weeks. Oh, here's what it was. This had some details about how much XP you get depending upon the mobs that you kill. I mean, we had some general ideas, but this gives you more of a, a concrete notion of how much more XP you get for taking on a mob that's higher level than you. He said when he was level 16, he got about 16 experience points per trash mob he killed. And that's not a lot, obviously. But uh, when he's fighting a mob that's his level or lower, then he's going to get uh, about two bonus XP. However, when he was fighting mobs that were about five or six levels higher than him, he got 75 bonus XP. So the game rewards you relatively heavily for fighting mobs that are higher than you. But once you got to a higher level, or in this case, when he was fighting with somebody that was level 28 and fighting mobs that were level 28, the bonus went back down. So if somebody tries to power level you, then that won't, uh, it doesn't seem to work. But that's kind of a very interesting notion about how much bonus XP you get for taking on the harder content. And I'm very happy to hear that. I like how there's no power leveling. That Absolutely. always frustrated me. Absolutely. <laughs> power leveling was just... Annoying that it existed because it was it was a pain and it was it was it felt like a chore and you usually had to pay somebody else to do it or your friend <laughs> had to waste his valuable time power leveling you, um, so yeah. And this also goes hand in hand with the announcement uh, that basically sidekicking up in PVE has been removed. Now in World versus World, of course, you still get sidekicked up, and in PVP, structured PVP, you still get sidekicked up. But there was at one point the notion that if freelancer had played for a thousand hours and he was level 60 and i was only a lowly level 30 because i'm a casual apparently wait wait, wait. i play for a thousand hours and i'm level 60 yeah well you're a casual <laughs> too i don't know and you're playing all the structured pvp you don't get any experience from that so anyway if okay, he's level 60 enough. and i'm level 30 that i could group with him and he would sidekick me up to 60 so i could quest with him that has been removed he can of course come down to where i am and he'll get sidekicked down but there's no long in PvE, and I, I don't think that that's really an issue. I mean, I think it's fine. What do you guys think? Yeah, I don't really see Part of, an like, issue. what they're doing. Like, they're, it's whatever. I mean, I personally would never want to be sidekicked <laughs> up. I, I, I like being sidekicked down. I think it gives you more of a challenge. Like, we've talked about this over and over again, how, like, you can go back and do the old content with your friends, and it's just, it's part of, like, that whole idea that they're making their game to get people to play with each other. It's just that simple. Well, I think when you do the side kicking, eliminating the side kicking, side kicking up makes it so that you can't skip content and that you have to sort of play through most of the stuff. If, if you were able to side kick up, you could skip, you know, whatever, 30 levels and go play with your level 60 friend um, and skip a whole bunch of good stuff. But at least the person who's level 60 coming down to play with you, it lets you still play through everything. And, and two, three, the just... 
is trying to point out that uh, I was probably wrong in this, but I, I know what he's talking about. There was a big discussion over, well, was he referring to dungeons only in this one tweet? And they, I believe that they, I, in all the threads that I read, they later went and uh, and corrected and said, no, we, we did remove it. The quote that I have is, one thing to note is that earlier, we talked about how we're going to allow players to sidekick up in level. We actually don't have that functionality in the game. So I'm pretty sure the answer to that whole discussion was that they, they, they took it out completely not just for dungeons. Um, I could be wrong on that, but I'm 95% sure that's right. However, I did like what Master Class said. I believe the way that he put it is that there is power leveling in the game, but only if you're boss enough to do it yourself. <laughs> that's fantastic. I love that. <laughs> wow. Only if you're boss enough to do it yourself. All right. Let's see if we can get through the news here. we got a lot more stuff to talk about. Now, according to GameStop, and there's a lot of questions concerning the collector's edition and pre-purchasing and all kinds of stuff but there was at one point somebody called GameStop or somebody called somebody and somebody official told somebody else that then posted in this thread that if you try to pre-purchase online you will not get the pre-purchase bonuses of the <clears throat> collector's edition you won't get the code that gets you into the betas early and things like that you have to go to the physical GameStop store if you try to pre-purchase online it will only be a pre-order they don't have the infrastructure to pre-order online you have to go to a physical GameStop store which sucks <laughs> see there, there's a, there's but there's a simple solution to this GameStop sucks just if you're going to order online, order through ArenaNet. But you can't order That's... the collector's edition through ArenaNet. Really? That's the bind that everyone no, is can. in. They, 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 yeah, <sighs> that you can't. They are, ArenaNet has pointed out in one of the threads on um, Reddit that they are not a shipping company. They don't, they don't hand, handle the physical shipping of goods. They don't have a network for that. They don't have the staff for that. They are a digital company, so they can do digital distribution because it's automated, and they're going to be doing it anyway when the game launches. But they have contracted out the, uh, the actual collector's edition business, and only GameStop took it. They haven't, don't have an exclusive deal. Why, why the hell would they only go with GameStop? GameStop is like the GameStop worst. GameStop was the only one that would do it. That's what I read is that Arena, uh, ArenaNet, you know, was talking to Amazon, but one of the things ArenaNet required from this is they required the retailer to take the full money cost up front, give the customer a code that would get them into the beta, and then deliver the, the physical goods later when the game releases. And uh, uh, apparently Amazon's stance is that they will not charge you the full price for a product that has not yet shipped. That's oh, their yeah, stance yeah, that's in America. Hard. So that's in other countries, though, yeah. that's not the same. Other Amazons, not American so, Amazons, that's, that's different. So now the only way to get a collector's edition is to go to a GameStop and pre-order that way. Yes. Pre-purchase that, that way. All the information that I've been able to collect says you have to go to a physical store and do the full payment to the GameStop, which I don't want to give GameStop my money. I'm going to go smash my face against the wall. I know what you. version of the game I'm getting now. So <laughs> That just made your decision for you? <laughs> I'm totally set now. I'm good. It's okay. If you don't give them some money, somebody else will. That collector's edition is going to sell out, man. It's, it's I very want that limited. collector's edition, but I don't want to go to GameStop. But look at this this way. You, you don't want to support GameStop, but GameStop's going to get supported anyway. I know they are. <laughs> It's, it's but like, I still hate them. Yeah. So much. I agree with you, man. But I need that Ritlock statue behind me to replace know, the I birds every week. <laughs> Not the bird. Uh, I guess I have to go to GameStop. We don't know when the beta starts. Some people say it's going to start this next weekend. I think it's going to start on the 21st because I doubt that they would do pre purchase on the 10th and then immediately have a beta the following weekend. I think that's too soon. Uh, for them. Wait, wait, so one more question. So now, is it April 10th you can go to GameStop and get the collector's edition? Yes. Or can you go well, like you right can, now and you get can, it? You can go and pre-purchase on April 10th. Apparently, some GameStops have been breaking the rules and yep. they have had their allocations of the collector's editions revoked. So people that are pre -order, pre trying to pre-purchase early are getting screwed, I think. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. There's some there's some question about that. It's it's. There's That's a big debate going on on Guru about the, that particular issue that I actually uh, was asked to bring up last episode. It's kind of a heated debate going on. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, a lot of stores, especially around Europe, there's there's many reports, people showing screenshots of their receipts and stuff where they went into a store. And we're talking last week. I mean, I don't know what's going on now with GameStop. But yeah, last well, here's, week, a, here's, a, here's a shot right now. This is one of the ones you're talking about. And um, they're, they're showing screenshots of their receipt uh, that show yeah, exactly that shows that they they purchased the collector's edition and they'll be receiving it when it arrives and they they did this like on April uh, oh, heck it was like early Six, early last or, yeah. or fifth something like that yeah and uh, there's huge outrage about it um, just uh, the lack of these stores uh, and a lot of these are uh, kind of no name they're European uh, stores to us to us Americans that you know we don't rec we wouldn't recognize half these names but they're selling them they're selling the collector's edition before they even get them uh, or even before they're allowed and it's a uh, it's a huge fail on arena net's part and these stores um, arena net for trusting them uh, to hold their word and the stores for breaking that that trust immediately so the distinction between pre-purchase and pre-order is the big sticker i think is that most yep. of the stores are just like oh it's a pre-order for a collector's edition okay well we can just start taking them now you know they they don't understand the the pre-purchase functionality that arena net's trying to put in there and maybe that was just never going to work in a normal retail chain and it was arena net's fault for trying to make it happen i don't know i mean those stores are always shady i i, I can't tell you how many times i like last year I went in there to buy something, and it was, like, related to World of Warcraft or something. They're like, oh, you want to put a pre-order on Diablo 3? And I'm like, there's not even a release date for it. That's not coming out for, like, another year. Why <laughs> Actually, the according to GameStop, they always have a release date on their website. <laughs> I know. That's why it's ridiculous. <laughs> <sighs> every every single time Guild Wars 2 right now you go to gamestop.com they have a release date on there. It's never correct, but you they want have, you to buy. So, yeah, you could have pre-ordered the, the the Guild Wars 2 years ago, I think from GameStop yeah. for like 5 oh, bucks. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and if you did, then you'd be like, "Crap, now I can't get pre-purchase. I have to give up that 5 bucks." <laughs> I still have I have $5 on a pre-order at something at, at GameStop from like 2 years ago. I'm just going to use that for this. <laughs> EB Games, they don't exist. They're the same EB Games, games was bought out by yeah. yeah by I think they're still known so. by the EB Games brand outside of the U.S. somewhere though. Um, so let's see here. the The last thing we've got going on uh, for news this week is Jordan Massey on the role of a squad in World v World. So this is a blog post that just recently came out. For those of you uh, that do not know what it's all about, I will give a very brief recap. Essentially, squads are methods of coordinating pickup groups in World vs. World as well as in PvE. And the way that it's going to work is that you can go to a commander or, or some kind of a merchant, an NPC, and purchase the right to create a squad. It's a single purchase, you make it once, and it costs a lot of gold, but once you make that purchase, you're able to, uh, to, from that point forward, create squads and become a commander of that squad. And from that point forward, anybody who's going around in World vs. World who's not in a squad will see a little marker over your head showing that you're a commander. They can click on you and join your squad. There's no specialty, invite only. They don't have to invite you. They don't have any control over who joins or leaves. So you see somebody with a mark, you can join it if you want or leave if you want, and there's nothing they can do about it. The only tools that the commander has is a few uh, sort of markers they can put on the map that says, bring supply here, attack here, defend here, rally point here. And the only other tool that this system gives is that the commander has the ability to send messages to everyone in their squad. Presumably the squad doesn't have a, a size limitation because they didn't mention it at all. And nobody else can talk in the squad chat, only the commander and he can give, give instruction or group and nobody else can talk in that commander channel. Theoretically, the idea is that every normal player who's in a squad will be using the team chat function of the uh, of the world versus world area. For example, if uh, our server's on there, there's always going to be, uh, you know, maybe a, a Borderlands red borderlands chat channel that everyone's by default in when they join that area and so if you want to tell something to the commander you either have to whisper it to him or you have to tell it through that main chat where everybody else is going to see it so there's been a lot of debate on this topic whether it's a good idea bad idea to have that one-to-many system i'd like to hear the panel's thoughts on it anybody want to go first um i'll start all right i i like i like the system um, I like the fact that you can just freely join and leave whenever you want. Um, 
But I also like the fact how you know you have the one commander that's issuing the orders, and that it, it gets a, uh, it brings a little bit of order to the chaos because the world we world can be pretty hectic with hundreds of people running around like chickens without heads trying to figure out what to do. Um, so if you have that one commander who is presumably a good player because they have all this gold to buy this privilege. Um, that hopefully it makes things a little bit more fun for people than when they have that more organized group mentality. Um, so I think it's a good thing. I know that there's going to be a lot of debate about the whole how much gold is it going to cost and the whole fact that it is gold. Um, but yeah, so that's how I feel on it. All right. Great. Your thoughts? Um, I think it's just a good system for pugs. In my opinion, it's going to work for them. I don't think, like, fully organized guilds and stuff, they might use it, but it's not going to be, like, the the key thing for them. They're going to have other ways to organize themselves. But I think the way they're giving out Commander is not the right way to do it at all. It, you can't just... And then the reasoning behind is what really irks me, because it says, like, the high cost also makes it likely that any Commander knows the game well. I don't think... Having money equals, like, un any kind of real experience in the game, especially since you can buy, you know, that's one of the big things, like, you can buy gold with gems. So, like, I just feel that there has to be a better way of handling giving out commander status, even though you can have commander status and not use it. It's just, you're going to have, I, the way I see it is, like, tons of little groups of, like, kind of wannabe commanders running around saying, join my group, let's go take this guy! And it's going to segment a lot of the groups when they should be like kind of combined into one well they they use the gold cost as a metric but you you don't like that metric in terms of trying to determine if somebody is experienced enough to lead for example what would you oh, use instead i don't think they have any currency in the game right now that could handle that would actually. you do it by level by time spent would, in world versus world if if i was a systems designer i'd probably add some new like statistic that tracks like how many keeps or stuff you've taken or like how many kills you have or s maybe how many siege weapons you've manned or something like how many siege weapon blueprints have you built and used or something to see if like they actually have world versus world experience like they're not just some guy who's like oh i have all this gold from doing pve content i can now be a commander in world versus world but i have no idea what's going on not so. a bad idea all right freelancer your thoughts okay so bridger you're telling me that this guy that buys this thing for however much gold gets a little icon that people home in on in World v. World, right? Well, any time that he wants to, he can mark himself as a commander, and then everybody will see it. Unless they are already in a squad, then they will only see their own commander's mark. Other okay. commanders um, can see each other's marks, too. Okay. Uh, conclusively, I can tell you that uh, Team Legacy will be taking out these people. <laughs> and uh, well, we won't see, causing we a... won't see yeah, the enemy's I marks, I don't think. Well, I mean, it'll, it, how obvious can it be if everybody's going to where this one guy is standing? I mean, come on. Um, <laughs> take the one guy and the rest of all, rest of the Zerg will scatter like flies because they have no idea what they're doing at well, that point. Well, I don't know if it's going to be that simple. He's no, not gonna... it, prob it probably won't, but you got you got two things going on here. Uh, one is you're giving the reins uh, to most likely people that have no business being uh, worldly world leaders in the least bit. Um, so you're going to run into the typical Zerg mentality, except instead of having somebody that's extremely chauvinistic and um, and you know charismatic, has, you mean charismatic? You know, <laughs> well, well, I mean, they just that that really loud guy, you know, that gets everybody to follow him. Instead of having that guy leading the group, now you have this guy that thinks he's somehow holier than thou because he had all of this money to burn on this. Uh, and it, it's both. It's which one's the the you know bigger loss? So that's really what it comes to. Um, any guild worth their weight is going to have a Teamspeak server. Is going to have event server. Any alliance is going to have their own methods of communications. This is really towards the casual players. We can agree on that, right? Yes, I think that's yes. what this tool is designed for. People okay. that, that are alone or maybe in very small groups that want to try to organize but don't have a larger organization with which to do that. This is allowing them to form an impromptu pickup group easily and quickly, and I think that's what it's designed to do. And for that function, I think it will succeed. I think it will, too. Um, whether it goes anywhere right beyond that, it's just going to be a Zerg. I mean, you're encouraging Zerg-like mentality when you do that. But um, hopefully with encouragement, um, everybody watching the stream and stuff, 
we all encourage all the guilds and all the servers to do it. You know, organize beyond that because I think at the very base level, this squad thing isn't going to work out, especially if you can't control that you have officers or you can't control, you know, more organization. It's just literally pop into the group and then you pop out just as easily. And that's not really teamwork, is it? Yeah, I like I said, what I hope is that they reveal some larger system for more organized groups, like the equivalent of a raid group. Not that I'm asking for raid bars and things like that, but the equivalent of an organizational structure that we can put in that Freelancer's talking about, a, a more disciplined form, a more private form of squads that where you have somebody that can create the system and then promote officers with separate squads and then each squad. And then that way you can see everybody on the map and you can tell which group is where. And it would allow somebody who's leading a large guild, for example, more tools with which to discuss and maybe have a private chat besides just all guild chat like we're, we're going on this thing and the, and the guild players that are that are just you know messing around in in pve don't have to see that the keep is under attack and blah 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 we don't want to use the guild channel necessarily for that if there's a a sort of raid channel for example a meta squad says <laughs> megan echo so that that I, I hope that we get some kind of tool like that revealed I, yeah I, I think it'd be great to have that for the guilds um but kind of touching on the whole commander system, not could I mean it? I mean it definitely is going to promote sort of the Zerg mentality because you can just give like attack here, defend here, get supplies here. Um, but the fact that, or the fact that you have to buy the gold or put the 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 gold in or to have that title, um, and the fact that people can leave your group freely just as easily as they can join it. Um, if you buy the, if you put the gold in to become the commander, and people in your group just start leaving, and all of a sudden you're by yourself again, you just wasted all that gold for nothing. Well, no, because it's a permanent or, thing. So anytime you want, you could then become a leader. The idea yeah, being yeah, that but, but, only but, but, people who but, are interested in leading will actually pay the gold. That's the idea, anyway. Okay, yeah, so they're gonna buy it no matter what. But what I'm they're saying just gonna is, buy is it. that. But what I'm saying is if you have people who just buy it to buy it and they're the commander, if you're not doing a good job as the commander or people are having a bad time in your group, they're just going to leave and find another commander. Right. And so well, that, that isn't, that, isn't that like a meritocracy, though? If you're doing a crappy job as a commander, they're going to go to somebody else, and then the best commanders are the people are the ones that are being followed. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I like about it. Okay. But I don't know, my I don't thing is, okay, towards, towards the end of the game, and we're saying towards the end of World v. World, or we'll say a year from now, okay, how many people are going to have access to that? Is this an unlimited thing? Is this where if I click on my mini map, now there's thousands of these icons? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, the horror. Can you imagine that? I mean, all right, Bridger, let's assume that you're a casual player, okay? <laughs> oh, here we go. The, the right. passive aggressive so, is overwhelming. Hey, hey, shh, shh, be, very, be very quiet. <laughs> Let me talk a second. All right, so you're the casual <laughs> player, okay? I buy this trinket, all right, and uh, I'm I'm just a random nobody. What makes you want to go to where I'm at and join my group and listen to what I have to say without knowing me at all? Why would you do that, Bridger? The only way, the reason that I can think of is I'm new to this and I don't have any friends to play with, so I'm just looking for some public group that's accepting invites, and that's how that's what the squad system is. So you see somebody with this icon over their head, they're running towards the keep, you run towards the keep too. You just have to try and follow them. You want to know exactly what they're going to next, so you join the group, and then you can see the commander typing, "You guys just lost this game." <laughs> So, all right, so your group, all right, you're, you join up with this group, right, and you take your keep because you have so many people with, with you, and then uh, a guild like Deuces comes by and completely wipes your whole group. So at this point now, Bridger, you as the casual player, what do you, uh, what do you think the average person is going to do right at that very moment? Uh, blame the commander. <laughs> It's the okay. commander's fault. <laughs> blame the blame the commander, or start raging at at the nearest guy that you think did something wrong. But the the conclusion here is that the group's going to kind of fall apart within itself, correct? So yeah, my, at yeah. that point, you're going to develop this mindset that when I start joining these groups, they're they're raiding, they're raiding, and then everything falls apart. And I think that you're going to find a lot of players while that you think this encourages uh, them to get together. I think. A lot of guilds and a lot of more organized players, those that want to take it seriously, are going to stay away with the 100-foot pole. 
and <laughs> because well, they know this, because, because they know what commanders. kind of environment it's fostering. I mean, but I, I, I disagree. I disagree because not everyone is going to have that hundred plus person guild that's really organized that can have that kind of fun. Not not everyone. Not uh, everyone's the way, that dedicated. The way, the way they I might look at Guild Wars Two once or twice a week. The the way I look at Guild Wars Two is the world versus world. That's not what Guild Wars Two is about. The world versus world is the icing on the cake. It is just, it's it's a nice thing to have and it's very fun, but it is not what Guild Wars Two is about. So you're gonna have plenty of players that are just going into the world versus world just to screw around and see what they can do and have some fun. So this commander thing is just simply a tool so that you don't have a group running around without any sort of direction. Even if you just have the one guy or in a year you have the thousand people, you just join one of them and the one guy says, all right, we're going to go attack over there because that's where all the other people are attacking. Even just having that little bit of organization, yes, it is not nearly as good um, or organized as a real guild, but not everyone's going to be in a guild that wants to dedicate the time to be that organized. I, I, I tend to agree with Vega a little bit here, and I think that specifically what this will do is it will clean up the, at least to some small degree, the main chat channel, because instead of having, you know, if, let's say this system didn't exist, the people who weren't joining guilds and weren't getting on the TeamSpeaker Ventrilo server, they would be typing in chat, you know, okay, everyone that's currently at Castle, what's its name, you know, if you're just in a group that's going from place to place, because you see them attacking, so you join and follow them as they're going from place to place. Uh, okay, everybody who's over here at, uh, you know, the castle, go to this castle. Like, you have to specify, okay, okay, if you're with me, go here. And if you're with me, go here. Try to, like, you know, organize everybody. Because not everybody's going to be paying attention to the same degree. And so maybe the group wanders off and only half of them follow. Because the other half are still, you know, checking something at the keep. Or they're upgrading something. Or they're bringing supplies, something. They're buying siege weapons. They have no idea where the group that they're just traveling with went to. This gives them a clear UI indication. There's the commander. Follow him. He's giving points on the map and saying, here's what we're doing as a group so i think if used correctly it can we you know more casual players can get a lot out of this and it will be a step stone that sort of gives them an idea of what guild organize organize organization looks like uh, it, because if they did not have this system at all it would be very chaotic and they wouldn't understand what's going on and they have no idea who to talk to or who to follow or why and this way it gives them even if it winds up being wrong half the time half the time is better than half the time doing it right is better than never getting it right at all no, what, ha disagree. what happens to those what happens to those poor saps where this is their first time getting out in world v world they don't know anything and they follow that guy that has no clue what he's doing he just bought one of those squad things what happens if the squad thing doesn't exist and they just follow that guy anyway? Well, why would they follow that guy then? Because I mean, he's because he's with a group and they follow a big group. I mean, I don't see it. I don't even see that as being a. They're not going to follow if a specific follow, guy. They're if, probably going to cl click on the map and say, "Okay, where's a bunch of people?" And they see a bunch of green dots and a and a, and a sort cross sword showing that a bunch of people from their server is attacking this thing. So they go there and they just follow the group itself. But instead of the group being just a blob of people who see each other and try to follow each other, this system provides a single leader that can give guidance to the group. And of course, like I said, it's going to be bad half the time, or maybe Someone... even more than half the time, but it's better to have good guidance sometimes. Someone just uh, had a really good idea in chat. Um, Al uh, Roxer um, said, why not give the ability to sort of rank... Um, Oh, commanders like if feedback. you have a if you have a commander title and you join that person's squad you can give them mm -hmm. a, the ranking of you know the one star to five star and then that would show up and that they'll let you know who kind of knows what they're doing and who's kind of just dicking around and not really it could doing. be open to trolling but it might work it could be open to trolling but at the same time you know it, it might be better than nothing the way the way i look at the whole commander thing it's it's a tool it's not it's not it can't make the game any worse by my by what the what I see. Ice has um, a fantastic idea. Every uh, capture point that you help take as a commander, uh, no, because then everybody would just make themselves commander in order to rack that number up. So every capture point that you help take as a commander with at least five or four or five followers, 
that are in your squad, you get like an extra, you know, point to your commander title. And people can see the more experienced commanders, you know, they'll, when they look at the thing, they can see, okay, this guy's got 40, you know, keeps taken. This guy's got three. This guy's got 10. And maybe they'll decide that way. But that also has, you know, oh, well, you joined the game three months after it launched. So you can't do anything. Nobody's going to follow you. Uh, great. You had a point earlier. Why am I pointing at the screen like, go ahead. You're just like, yeah. <laughs> I'm pointing at Freelancer uh, because I'm pointing at my other monitor and Freelancer's over here. Hang on. I got to go. Okay. There we go. Great. Yes, go I'm ahead. down here. <laughs> so what I, what I, what I, meant to say, what I was going to say was like, I kind of disagree with kind of everyone. I just think this commander thing is going to lead to a lot of fragmentation in World mm -hmm. World on servers. It's going to lead to like tons of different groups popping up because I think a year down the line, everyone is going to have commander there's like probably going to be no reason why people don't have it because they're always going to have I, extra gold eventually yeah i think the eventually yeah. gold yeah. is going to get to a point where the people are like oh i'll just throw down the money for it maybe if i, I want to try it one day i mean people buy things and never use them all the time so like i don't see this being any different so what we're going to have is like a ton of different fragmented groups people who think they can lead people who actually can lead and they're going to be all over and it's going to it's going to be interesting I don't know if it's necessarily going to hurt or harm. I think it's going to more harm World of this World to have a ton of smaller groups like running around all over the place. But we'll, you know, we're going to have to wait and see about that. I think, I think that Monster points out a lot of people don't like to lead. I don't think we'll ever have a problem with too many commanders. I think a lot of people are shy. I think there are very few people that are like us. I mean, the people in Team Legacy, for example, the people that we surround ourselves with just happen to be the kind of personalities that, I mean just the people on this podcast. You, I wouldn't have brought you guys in this podcast unless you were able to hold your own in conversation and, and jump in to interrupt people and tell them why they're wrong. These kinds of personalities, I'd say are maybe, what, 10% of the population. And I think that's going to be the same in Guild Wars 2 as well. People aren't going to want to be in the spotlight at, by and large. So I don't think but we're ever going to have a problem of too many people. I think, I think that it might get to the point, like, a year down the road when everyone can theoretically buy this commander title and you're going to have you know however many commanders running around i would hope that at that point they have some sort of system that lets you know which commanders have been there longer and know what they're doing and have more success or the fact that if you are someone who's doing world v world a lot you're going to recognize certain people or certain names that are a commander that's, so that's if, how you, it if you if you hammer too so. If you if you start it, you know the game comes out, you start doing the world v world. That first person who buys that commander title, I guarantee you, everyone's going to join that commander just because he's the only commander out there. Yeah, he's the only yeah. one that saves you know? up and, enough and money. He's, and he's either going to you know do a good job, and everyone's going to be like, yeah, this is great, blah blah blah. He's going to be like, he's going to fail, and everyone's going to be like, all right, whatever, we'll just go back to zerging. But you know, then more commanders are going to start popping up, and it's not. You know, you're going to know who's been there longer, I feel like. If you're really into the World v. World scene and you're constantly doing it, you're going to see certain commanders popping up more often than not. Red96 um, says commanders should get a minus 50% XP gain so that they have to sacrifice in order to lead and that, that would make less trolls because the people who truly do want to lead will take the commander position. That'll work so right up until all commanders at, get to 80. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, okay. <laughs> Or maybe they have to, they have, I mean, somebody else said, you know, pay, have, the, have it instead of being a, a high gold price, have it being a medium gold price, but you have to pay it every time the server's reset, every two weeks. That's another I, idea. I Everyone think that the, the anti-trolling the anti tool is the fact that anyone can freely leave and join your squad that's as they want. That's true, too. This is a lot if of you, if, you're, if you're trolling, if you're just a commander that's like, all right, go to tech that keep, and then you pick a keep on the other spot. I'm bouncing back and forth, and people are like, what is this guy doing? Whatever, I'm leaving. I'm just going to go, go join someone else if there's so many other commanders out there. I think that is the anti-trolling tool, the fact that you can freely join and leave squads as you please. Yeah, it it's definitely sounds like it's going to be... I mean, everybody seems to have a different opinion of how it's going to work out, and some people are... Uh, what, let's, let's very briefly talk about... What do you think about the, the way they set up the chat, where the commander's the only one that can talk in it? specifically uh is is this a problem because some people have pointed out well what if i want to tell the commander hey we have enemies coming in from the south we need to turn the group around or we need to you know go defend that keep i have to either figure out how to whisper the guy or i or have to tell it to the like entire thing or flail your arms like an idiot do an emote hope he looks <laughs> like a pointing <laughs> and he'd be like Arr. <laughs> that's one thing you can um, buy you can buy an emote where you glow and you point so everybody sees you. <laughs> I don't know. 
Uh, well, so what do you think? One to many. Is this is this a, a genius move by ArenaNet to, co- to to get rid of the the blame that goes on in those kind of channels, or is it a big problem because now the the group can't communicate with the leader, only the leader to the group? I don't think it's a problem because the whole reason why they're doing the commander system is to get away from a single chat channel just getting spammed by many many people. Mm-hmm. So if you had if you then let everyone talk in the squad chat, you'd pretty much have the same thing as everyone just being able to talk in the world v world chat, for example. I, w- I, I think um, one solution might be to let people be able to sort of either ping the map or do something in certain increments so that someone couldn't just sit there and keep on clicking on the map and pinging a certain location. But, you know, if you get, if you as the commander can see where people are pinging, to let them kind of say, like, oh, ping the spot where the enemy's coming in. You can kind of get an idea that, oh, something's going on over there. We might have to turn around. Yeah, because there are tools in that five-man um, group. I guess group and squad are the two different terms, I think, that we're using here. Uh, and, you know, a five-man group that you could go into a dungeon with, for example, or a party that you would, you know, normal, you could in, that's the invite. I invite you to this group. That's limited to five pers- people as far as we know. That one lets you draw on the mini-map to show people things, and, and, and those kinds of tools are available in that one. We don't know if they're available in squad, but basically they didn't mention it, so I think we can assume that those are not available and that only the things that they mentioned, the, you know, rally here, attack here, defend here, and bring supply here, waypoints that they can put on the map are the only methods that the commander has to uh you know sort of draw on the map i would guess i think it's being a little bit too safe and i think trollers are going to troll like all day so like they're going to find ways to abuse the system no matter what you do and it's going to happen like you you can't put you can put all the precautions you want in the world for this but it's going to happen but Someone was just mentioning Dota 2. Like in Dota 2, you could ping the map and draw on the map all you want, and everyone can see it all the time. I haven't been in a single game where someone's just sitting there all game, just like ping, 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 or, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> drawing, drawing penises on the map and blah, blah, blah. We got to go here, you know, like. That's yeah, because it it's not Heroes of New Earth. <laughs> oh! I, that's Uh-oh. right, I went there. Here comes there. the mail. <laughs> I went there. <laughs> Feedback at Uh <laughs> All right, we've kind of beaten this topic to death here. Any final thoughts? I like the system. All right, we'll have to see how it plays out. Only time will tell. All right, so this is a new segment I wanted to bring in here, the forum comment of the week. Quote, Oh my God, you can buy things with gold? People who farm gold will have an advantage in World vs. World. We'll have to limit the ability to earn gold, or this game is going to be so imbalanced. Oh, as if other games didn't allow people who buy gold for money from gold sellers, or people didn't funnel money from cash from wealthy characters to alts to give their new characters a leg up. I swear, some people seem to want a communist economic system in their MMOs all of a sudden. This is, unquote, this is from... Fiantar on the MMORPG.com forums. And this kind of brought something to light as we've been talking about the whole pay-to-win thing for a while here. And this kind of gives throws it on the other shoulder. It's, okay, well, if we didn't have any cash system, then who are the people that can pay to win? The people who have tons of gold. And who has tons of gold? The people that have tons of time. Or the people who have paid illegally. But let's just ignore that for the moment and talk about the people who have tons of time. Basically, what we're saying is... It's not okay to pay to win with real cash that you earned through time, but it is okay to pay to win through time that you use to play the game. That seems like a weird dichotomy to me. Is that that dissonant to any of you guys? Does that sound like it's contradictory? Or is there actually some divide here? No, that's... I think that's the whole point. Like, it's supposed... It's dissident. Like, it doesn't make any sense to us because we can think. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I, that's you, really Blake. harsh, but like I wanted this whole... fewer listeners. Thank you very much. I wasn't trying to get five thousand subscribers. I was trying now. to make them go away. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me on the show for one last time. Then. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice knowing you, great. <laughs> All right, no, go ahead, continue. Yeah, but I think it's just people are just getting really rustled over really nothing, and they're kind of like they're making the they're making it like 
bad in their minds. Like they're making it seem worse to themselves than it really is. And they're making like huge deals and they're getting upset about tons of things that they really shouldn't be getting upset about. Like time is time. If you want to spend time in the game or time in real world, it's up to you. And I'm not saying it should be pay to win, but I'm just saying time is money. That came out weird. Monster says it's not pay to win, it's dodge to win. I don't think that meme's <laughs> ever going to bo- <laughs> fail. Um, but uh, but D- Derry Thus says if someone spent so much time playing a game, they should be able to pay to win because they spent so much time on the game. They basically, that's saying someone has a lot of leisure time on their hands that they sacrifice to play this game, therefore they deserve something. I hate that mentality with so much vitriol that literally my monitor might fall apart from the acid that's spitting out of my mouth right now. I cannot stand the I spent time on this, therefore I deserve bullshit that comes from so many... I'm going to get in a bridge rant here, so i got to stop. Don't bridge rant. Don't bridge rant. Deep breath. Deep breath. Deep breath. We're straight. Okay, I held it in. All right. We got to go one week without a bridge rant. <laughs> It's supposed to be every, like, couple of weeks. I've been doing it too damn long. Stop. Anyway, I can't stand that. I hate I hate it so much. I don't know. Am I crazy? Freelancer? No, you're not, you're not crazy. But you, you know I disagree with you on that, Bridger, so we'll leave it at that. You think I mean, that time should mean more than skill? Uh, no, not at all. But I think uh, if you look at any real-world scenario, uh, two athletes, one that uh, is naturally skilled at what he does, okay? You mm-hmm. know, he makes it to a certain point. But I always feel that the athlete that trains every day, all day, and he, and he didn't initially start with that skill, and he works his way up to that point, I fully believe that he deserved it more than the guy that innately had the skill. I really do. Well, I agree with you to the point that, yeah, that's definitely that training to get better at something, that time spent. I mean, everybody talks about the 10,000-hour rule, right? If you want to master something, you need to spend 10,000 hours doing it before you can truly be you know, considered to have mastered it. You know, be it, you know, a, a, an instrument or playing a particular genre of game or driving a car or what have you. The 10,000 hour rule is, is the generic thing that people use. And so I, I don't have a problem with skill learned by spending time. I think people do get better as they do. But the people that just have this image that I should be more powerful than other people for example, in Guild Wars 2 because I spent more time playing, not because I'm better at the game. I should just have better gear and be able to face roll them because I spent more time playing than they did. That's the kind, I'll I'll clarify, that's the kind of concept that I have that vitriolic reaction to because that's what I hate the most. Yeah, and I I sort of agree with you there because there, there comes a point when you, as a human being, have to have common sense, you know, and if you're spending your time doing whatever and you do not have the same stuff as the guy that played half as much time as you then basic math says that either a you're but you've been wasting your time or you've just been an idiot or b you're i don't know idling i mean it's (laughs) i mean there's no telling i mean if if it if it gets to that point where you think you've played 20 hours and that guy that has played five hours has the same gear as you, so you think the game is somehow broken, I agree with you there, Bridger. That that is, that's such an invalid argument. But at the same time, um, that guy that has played 20 hours, and then uh, somebody that's played, let's say, that five hours and has relative same gear, does. And this is where we talked about it a few episodes ago. Uh, where he does something gimmicky with that new gear or he finds out new bugs and stuff and somehow overcomes the guy that's played a whole lot longer and has that experience, I think that's wrong. And um, in in any competitive setting, I scenario that started out as the no-name guy. Mm-hmm. You, you track him through his progress. You track him through his progress. And somehow he just he enters those entry-level qualifiers. He gets to the tournament level, and now... He doesn't have much. He doesn't have many fans, but he's starting to compete against the top players. Mm-hmm. That has always been my guy. That has always been the type yep. of players I follow. And um, those I've are the never been the stories. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And I've never been the type that follows those guys that do. You know, that guy that played five hours. You know, that just is naturally good at the game. And um, I think that all guilds, even those na- uh, kind of jump into guilds real quick here. You know, guilds that now are are recruiting. Uh, based strictly off of pure skill or what they think is skill, um, it runs into the same problem, Bridger, because they uh, they believe that 
all of that time spent in previous MMOs, uh, and this actually kind of agrees with you. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> all, all, all of that time spent in previous MMOs somehow makes them entitled. You know, that, that makes them better than the average player. Ooh, use the bad word. Uh, so, yeah, you, the bad word. You're right. So how many, of us, how many of us now in, in, this, in this chat and, and listening to this podcast see these guilds recruiting, and, and they will be all the way until launch, that say unless you've played this or unless you've been in this tournament or unless you've been in – uh, you have this arena rating, or then you're not good enough, you know. And somehow they seem to think that, like gear, uh, or like hours played in an MMO, if you did not reach that certain point, then you are you're worthless. You're not mm -hmm. you're not worth our time. I cannot stand that. I mean, it's um, in that respect, I agree with you, Bridger. Um, it's one of those things that it's a whole lot more than the hours you put into the game to get that gear uh, in, in the MMO, for example. It's, it's your aptitude, it's your mentality, it's your intelligence. I mean, when you are in that game spending that five hours, that guy, and he has the same gear, what did he do differently than the guy with 20 hours? Chances mm -hmm. are he intelligently did the research, he looked at what he needed to do, he didn't waste his time, and um, that's, that's how the game should be played. And um, sadly, 80% of the community will not do that, and they will complain. And uh, that's just... I mean, when you're dealing with players that come from Farmville versus players that come from WoW, uh, you're going to run into that no matter what. I'm sorry. It's just going to mm -hmm. happen. Absolutely. We just all have to deal with it. Yep. And, and for, for what it's worth, the numbers that I have heard when it comes to, for example, mastering something and the different times that it takes people to master something, they, they did a study of chess players and people that became really good chess players and, or decent chess players. And they found that the one thing that all of the top chess players had in common was that they all had at least 3,000 hours, I think it was, played in sort of competitive environment. Now, some of those really good players only needed 3,000 hours to get that good. Some of them needed, three, needed you know, 6,000. Some of them needed 10,000. But if you got below 3,000, you couldn't find any really good players. So there's always a, a sort of threshold where once you, when you take any kind of game, you have to spend a certain amount of time with it in order to you know be good at it and then you have those players that are inherently good and that's all they need to get to a certain level and other players need to spend an extra thousand hours an extra you know 500 hours whatever to get to the same point and but it so it, some people have to train more than others but basically i think that kind of study kind of shows you that anybody can do it some people take 10,000 hours some people take 3,000 hours it just takes dedication and and that's sort of encouraging in some aspects too if you want to do something you should be able to if you dedicate yourself to it and that's the important part um, yeah, yeah and, sure. and it's more than just your gear too bridger you know mm -hmm. it, it's about your 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 reputation it's about your your history you mm -hmm. know that's kind of heading into esports community there, but you know these players, the the those players we're talking about now that hop in and expect to be at that level because they play 50 hours, you know, uh, a week. Those are the kind of players that three years from now will still be wondering why they're a no name. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's one of those things. It takes that, more than just time. Certainly, uh, active learning yep. and training of specific skills and things like that. There's a lot more to competitive. We'll talk a lot more about that on Straight Talk. With Tales of I, I was a competitive uh, RuneScape player, so therefore I'm entitled. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's so, just stop using that word. <laughs> I think another thing that makes Guild Wars 2 different is the fact that I feel that knowing your skills and the skills have a greater weight than your gear, per se. Whereas in WoW, it was very gear oriented, but in Guild Wars, you gain more from knowing your skills that much better than you do from just having a really good armor set. Yep, just, absolutely. Just, uh, just the, the way that Guild Wars 2 is this Guild Wars, they even said that they want you to know the skills and they have all these skill combinations and they want you to spend your time on your skills, not on your gear. Um, and you know, we're all having this conversation, but in the end, it really doesn't matter because Guild Wars 2, like Guild Wars 1, Power whether Plato. I play... Yeah, exactly. I play that five hours or Bridger plays that 20 hours. It's still going to come down to me kicking Bridger's butt because... <laughs> because I uh, I put more effort into it, you know, and and I have that uh that higher level of clarity in PVP. Just kidding, Bridger. I love oh. it. 
<laughs> Listen, I'm only going to get the first week off. You're going to get your, your cushy job where you get to sit at home and work from home and play Guild Wars all yeah. day. And I'm going to have to go to work and sometimes be interrupted by customers while I'm playing Guild Wars. I mean, dang it. That's just not fair. <laughs> all right. But... Uh, we're going off on another tangent here. Uh, let's see. That, that I think, was a really interesting discussion. We're at, like, over an hour here, so I think we'll leave the mailbag for next week. I'm assuming that next week we won't have any, uh, you know, beta discussion happening. But if I'm wrong and they do have the beta on the 13th, 14th, 15th weekend, we'll definitely have tons of stuff to talk about next week. So uh, I do want to get to these mailbag questions. I know a lot of you have been sending them in and I keep putting them on the agenda, but we keep running out of time because we have all this stuff to talk about. Uh, so I guess to, uh, to, to wrap it up here, PAX was awesome and we got to meet Martin. That was great. If he watches this, that's awesome. And if you guys could... Uh, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. It's the Sound Strategy Network on uh, on YouTube. Search for Sound Strategy Network and you'll find it. And it's also linked, of course, on, on the website, talesofteria.com. I would appreciate that from you. That would uh, certainly help me out a little bit because we are trying to get our channel partnered and that would give us some better tools to display everything. So... I definitely want to give away more of this swag next week. It's going to be awesome. Uh, that swag. That Guild swag. War 2 beta key, Bridger? Did I hear that earlier? Yeah, right? I've got, oh, I've got right. Guild War 2 beta keys. Those are going out. Uh, you know, We'll talk about releasing those uh, next week as well. So what's, what's the question this week, ladies and gents? Give me a good question. What did we talk about oh. tonight that we want to hear about from our listeners? What do you uh, think about gamer entitlement in games? Do people... Th Literally oh, think Lord. that because they, yeah no I really we're, want get, we're gonna get we're getting like so many paragraphs. Here. This is a really big topic right now. It goes beyond even Guild Wars 2. I want to see what people think about it. Like, what do you think about gamer entitlement? And people who think they deserve special things because of what they do in games or how much time they put in or whatever. Oh, here we go. All right, the Pandora's box is opened. Awesome <laughs> feedback at talesofteria.com is how you can get a hold of us. For everybody else, I'm Bridger signing off. Have a good night. Good night, see everyone. You guys. Good night. How, how bad I wanted to rant about some some things. <laughs> Come on, man! You can do that. I got the music ready. You can tell me you got to go. No, we, we were short on rant. time. Just <laughs> some some uh, some of these guilds, these new ones, found you know, founding all of a sudden because they want to get the guild bonuses. Uh, oh, it irks me so much. It's and you know, it only bonuses. it only irks me because you know, obviously, I'm quote unquote a guild leader. So it's uh, you know, I. I a part of me wants to see other guilds exactly like, uh, you know, in the spirit of Team Legacy, organizing and doing all these things to set up World v. World and structure PvP. But there's so many guilds out there that think it just naturally falls together. So they think by getting in all of these elitist, hardcore, uh, fill in the word here, great, elitist, hardcore what? Uh, <laughs> pompous. I don't even know. That, that's pretty good right there. Yeah, I mean that somehow it's just <laughs> entitled. That somehow it's just gonna all perfectly work, and we're gonna win so many tournaments, and we're gonna make all of this money. And uh, if they only knew. You know, so, you know what I would say. I would say that Guild Wars Two looks like it plays so much differently than all these other MMOs that if you were an expert at those MMOs, you would have a harder time at Guild Wars Two. Oh, by the way, great. Tell us what you, you know, thought about the Secret World. The shittiest game I've ever played in my life. <laughs> Hands down, I'm writing an article Bridger, now. Bridger, uh, Vega yeah. just hit something on the nail. You need to do an episode on whether MMO skill from WoW or Warhammer, etc., carries over into Guild Wars 2. You will have the biggest debate of people arguing Ooh. you've ever seen. All right, I'm <laughs> writing it down. Where's my topics thread? That's uh, uh, does, does Guild War two uh, does Guild Wars one? Actually, you what you really want to hit it on the head? Ask this question to the community. Say, if I was uh, gold trim in Guild Wars one, does that mean I'm going to be good in Guild Wars two?
watch everybody epic flame and troll and <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll be great because I cannot stand I cannot stand here's another rant of mine okay the the players that that come from Guild Wars 1 some of not all of them some of them um, and uh, it's very few and far between especially on team quitter uh, where if they're gold trim however they got the gold trim it makes them somehow better than you no matter what game you come from it's because I played Guild Wars 1 in GVG your 29 2800 arena rating uh you know that's nothing compared to what I did because uh, I played Guild I don't Wars know about One. That. I, I was yeah, going to say it's... the only the only analogy that I can think of when it comes to World of Warcraft is people that played in the arena are going to have some skill that transfers because it's the whole moving through combat thing and and a WoW arena I believe at least I didn't actually play in it but if it was anything like any of the other PVP then. It had a decent amount of, you know, you have to have pretty fast reaction times, hit the cooldowns exactly at the right time, interrupt them exactly at the right time. I mean, Guild Wars 1 had its own version of that with the interrupts and things like that. But you're saying that the people from <laughs> Guild Wars 1 are coming in and going, we're clearly superior to the people that had it in World uh, of Warcraft. This guy, Hinoji, you made my night. Hinoji says, they sure have a higher whining skill. Oh, <laughs> the ones who won was the great. Ones the Guild Wars was great. It was a genius. I love that. But uh, yeah, I get that but all the I don't, time. I don't think I don't think it's a direct transfer because I mean, if you take something like like League of Legends or Heroes of New Earth or Dota Two, they are all the same general type of game, and they all play very similarly. But you take someone who is a top tier League of Legends player and you throw them into Dota Two. When they've never played Dota 2 before, they will get destroyed. There are for some fundamental doubt. differences between those games that really there, there cause are a some big fundamental. Divide. But that's the thing. There are some fundamental differences between Guild Wars 2 and World of Warcraft, and even Guild Wars 1. And I feel that the, See, those here, fundamental I'm, differences make the difference. I'm I'm the and you know in this in this discussion of MMO skill, I'm the weird guy in the corner that has done Cal S. You know for the. There's tournaments and stuff. So. Well, that's not true. I, I mean, yeah. I did. I, I was in a top twenty TFC clan, and then I was in uh, a COD clan after that, and there was a DOD clan in there at some point. So my my competitive experience comes from first person shooters as well. So, and I think that uh, first person shooter experience and but to some degree MOBA experience is going to count more than experience from other MMOs. I could be wrong on that. Maybe, you know, like, like I said, the closest analogy that I can think of is the, the high-end PvP in something like WoW Arena, just because the, co the controls were so tight in that, that there was a lot of control-based, movement-based stuff going on. But Don't somebody tell in the that chat to said, a GVG -er. <laughs> oh, no, I know, but I, I can't speak for GVG. Maybe GVD is also up there, but I didn't actually physically play it. So I'm just going to say no comment as far as GVG's comparison to, to World of Warcraft or anything else like that. Um, if I we do an like, episode on this, there will be so much flame mail. Yeah. I we, feel, we just got to say, who would win a 1v1, a GVG player or a WoW Arena player? Oh, man. <laughs> the, the, the world Miane keeps that's yelling like an about unstoppable Terra. force hitting an immovable object. It will be epic. Miane says Terra players are going to be the ones that are going to dominate in Guild Wars because it has a dodge button. <laughs> well, I, I played Terra, and it's, it's a lot more active than anything out there It was right the now. only like, one makes... that hacks that I thought looked at all interesting from a combat perspective. Yeah, it's, it's very, very, um, I want to say twitchy. I don't think that's yeah. the right word, but I'll, I'll even use that because I like it. It's very twitchy. Like there were, point, I played in a demo and like I was playing a lancer and it's a tank and like there's points where you have to see, you see the mob doing something and I have to put my shield down and block it. So it's kind of like if you have to do that, you kind of it's like kind of like dodging guild wars. Like you see the trolls going back with his like axe or something, and you got to dodge it because all your skills are dodged apparently. <laughs> that. Um, the, the so the, the as far as mechanically. Uh, Firefall didn't look like anything special. It looked like a third-person shooter, which is what it was. Uh, Terra looked, you know, semi-interesting, like like Great's talking about with the sort of more active combat, similar to Guild Wars 2. The, re the similar to the reasons why I like Guild Wars 2. But I watched the Secret World being played, and oh my, my God, God, please, the most boring what? thing ever. The, when I first walked up to somebody playing it, and I just looked at their screen. They had a little bit of quest text up in the corner, and it said, "Collect body parts from zombies from the ocean. Collect body parts at the school. For sure. Collect X this. Collect Y." that and i'm like really i the it first even my that. first impression was that sort of boring ass kill kill quest 
people can deal with that. It wasn't even that that just fucking destroyed me about this game. It was just like the game, like everything. All the systems are just fucking broken in my opinion. Like they just <laughs> don't work. Literally, they do not work. Like I was playing this guy, I just I just walked into the booth. They had no one in their booth for very good reason. And I walked into the booth and I pick up I go to the console and of course, you know, there wasn't a, I usually, you know, usually it's good to have a developer there, but I, there was nobody around. So I'm like, "All right, let me give it a shot." I'm playing this guy and I'm like I'm going through it, and I'm like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. The game isn't explaining a thing to me, and I'm going through it, and apparently, like, the game wants you to play with other people, so it doesn't try to, like, encourage you to play. It literally forces you, because there's monsters that have, like, skulls next to their names, and they're, like, tough monsters, and they're all over. Like, you can't leave, like, you can't take four fucking steps, and then there's, like, tons of them, and you can't kill them by yourself. So, like, you need to group with other people. You're at a demo, so, like, everyone's kind of just running around doing their own thing. You can't really group with anyone. And it's just, it was not a good demo, I think. And I think it's just a bad game. Miyane says, Terra adds a new layer to quest grinding. Not only do you need to kill 100 hyenas, but not all the hyenas will count. <laughs> I just have to point out that World of Warcraft pioneered that long before. Everybody yeah, knows did. on the Baron quests that not all Zevras had a hoof. But every raptor had a head for some reason. Even though every Zephra has four hooves, you would not, sometimes you can't collect one from them. They'll never have more than one, but for some reason every raptor has a head. So that's, that's always confusing. So, so great if one of those developers came up and said, Hey, buddy, I'll give you 100 bucks if you say something good about the game. What would you, what would you do? Wait, if well, they had said while well, we were like there? Think that I'm, you could buy a lot of Taco like, Bell with 100 bucks. I know. <laughs> I know it's very tempting, but I mean, uh, they already tried bri- they already tried bribing you with swag and stuff like that, and that doesn't work. I like to think I have some <laughs> integrity at the end of the day. Like I'm like I'm not gonna do that. Were the were the razor having... booth babes there? There were not a lot. The only oh, booth babe of any note was the girl that uh, they, the they had the, the lollipop chainsaw one. Yeah, they had a model everyone, playing her. her. I I was at this one convention. I demand picks. One. Picks or it didn't there, happen. Just type it in. Lollipop pop chains is all girl. <laughs> I, I was at this one convention for work over. one time. It was a like, it was called PitCon. It, it's like mass spectrometers and all this like scientific stuff that's like just like science stuff. And there was literally like 15 booths there that had booth babes for like, come look at this microscope. And like there's a booth babe like showing a microscope. And I thought it was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Yeah, last year, uh, at PAX East, the only booth that had booth girls per se was the Duke Nukem Forever booth. Do you remember that? Of course. Did anybody else yeah. go there? They had just had, you know, the girls in school well, girl outfits to, that you could go pose next to and sit in the king's chair and pretend that you were, uh, that you were him. So that was, that was the only one that I could remember. And the Lollipop Chainsaw was the only blatant one that I saw. I mean, Alienware had, you know, pretty girls manning their booths, but they weren't, like, sexualized and dressed. They were just dressed normally, uh, well, normally-ish. But, you know, they weren't, it wasn't over, over the top. And PAX has always frowned on you know, the over-the-top booth babes thing. And it seems like that, they that, cracked down on it in the past. Well, what that would be the, uh, for, for the girl gamers, what would be the equivalent of that? That's a scary thought. Booth Boom guys? Dudes. Booth dudes? Booth, booth dudes. <laughs> booth dudes. <laughs> yeah. Sign up. I could just see uh, already one of the um, feedback emails, Bridger. I don't appreciate you guys <laughs> talking about booth babes. I, I just It's going to happen. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I just found a rele- relevant article is relevant on Kotaku.com. Literally the front page. Skimpy outfit gets lollipop chainsaw cosplayer asked to leave PAX. Word is wow. that Jessica Negri, a big time cosplayer hired to portray the protagonist of Lollipop Chainsaw, was asked to leave PAX East yesterday. Why? Maybe that hot pink jumpsuit with a neckline plunging down to her crotch had something to do with it. <laughs> that was, that's interesting. That's a pretty ridiculous outfit right there. It is pretty oh, ridiculous. Wait, what? Yeah, that's that that was yeah. It's right on the front page of Kotaku. I see it. And you know, I noticed that today she was wearing a much more conservative outfit compared to like the cheerleader outfit that she was in on Friday. I didn't see her in that pink one yesterday, probably because she was asked to leave. <laughs> Actually I didn't walk around the expo hall yesterday, I don't think. So 
That was interesting. <laughs> is Lollipop Chainsaw supposed to be a game or something? It's a it game is. that's coming out. It's about a cheerleader that kills zombies by dressing skimpily and using chainsaws and fighting moves or something. It's 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 done by this guy that's done a ton of other like games of the same vein with like highly sexualized women and it, everybody knows exactly what it is. It's not trying so, to hide what right. it is. Last question before we cut out. Who won between Killy? T T T L the T L show off Killy and Feyrana who won? Uh, Feyrana crushed him, but it was because it was his first time. <laughs> oh. They did the Numa Numa song. It was great. Oh, However, oh, oh, I, I am told when they went to play Rock Band, that's something that Killy's played before. They both played on Expert and they rocked the house. That's all right. Very so cool. That's good. But I'm gonna I'm gonna get on Killy for getting beat by a girl. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're doing that, are we? All right. I'm gonna make sure Faye's in there. All <laughs> right. I gotta get up early tonight tomorrow. I don't know if uh, I drops is in the channel here. Let me look. See if he's around. Uh, is he on Teamspeak? Is anybody on Teamspeak? I'm, gonna go. I'm sure a ton of people are. What do we have our League of Legends thing, right? Yeah, I just wanted to throw people over to his channel if he's actually going to be on or not. I'm not sure if he is. I Hang don't on. think he is. Twitch.tv slash iDrops. And if you guys want to subscribe to the Twitch TV, that will help too. I don't know if that ever is going to come anything come of it. But it would give more legitimacy to our to our show if we had more subscribers on Twitch. I'm trying to get a uh, team channel set up for Team Legacy. And DJ Wheat just told me to email him and he'd be able to hook us up with that. So... That should be that should be good. So that when Guild Wars Two comes out, we can have good luck with that because us. that guy is like I think he has to be the busiest man on earth. He might be. In all honesty, he might be. Like Jesus, he I wanted I got an interview with him this weekend, and it was like the most intense thing I ever had to do. Like I had to literally go by his booth like four or five times that on a on a Saturday because I stopped by on Friday and he was insanely busy. He said, "Come by tomorrow. Come by tomorrow. We'll do it tomorrow." I'm like, "All right, I'll come by around 12." And he's like, "Yeah, that sounds good." And I would st I stopped by like three or four times between like different things and he's insanely busy. I can't wait till I'm that busy because I'm an internet celebrity. <laughs> oh, actually, that's not true. I forgot to mention on the show. I somebody some dude in a diner saw me and was like, "Oh man, I love your show." And I was like, "Awesome, right back at you." I mean, um yeah, thanks. <laughs> and then and then we went to order because the waitress came over. And then when I turned back to, to find out what his name was, I wanted to give him a shout out on the show. But he was gone. And Gaver insisted that he had never been there. But I think he's just messing with me. <laughs> uh, All right. I'm cutting the stream off. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, Gaz, Gaz uh, you understand that even on – you know, where there's so many Reddit threads where – Team Legacy comes up and they're like, "Well, we're all just going to roll on where whatever server Team Legacy is going to roll on." Um, yeah, common sense, buddy. Uh, I love you. I love all the fans. You know, you know how all that goes. But the very second we say what server, you know, Tales of Tyria and DJ Wheat and and everybody else that's coming along with us and Team Legacy, what server we're rolling on? Guess what's going to happen the very next second? Bridger, that what's server's going to be full, <laughs> locked. No, no, not just I mean, full, locked. I, I, and I, you know, on Reddit, I try to answer in the, in the nicest, most professional way that, no, we're not telling you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's, it's hard to answer that because we do want all the people that, that like Tales of Tyria and Team Legacy to join us, you know, and, and be a part of that, that World v. World But we need to also experience. make sure that our actual guild members make it into the server before we make that announcement, essentially. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just, it, it's good. one of those things that it, you just can't. We server. Just tell them a different server. <laughs> wow. wow. But remember, remember, the, the only troll. thing this prevents them from doing is playing World vs. World with us. So if we wanted to have some kind of Team Legacy event where we, you know, 10 versus 10 match or, or several that have to do with Team Legacy or, 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 or Tales of Tyria, we can do that because you can do that cross-server. We can have a big thing. Let's go kill, you know, Zaitan together or let's go, you know, do this big PvP elite or, or PvE elite event as a group just for fun and we'll broadcast it and it'll be great. You know, those kinds of things we can absolutely do. And no matter what server you're on, you'll be able to come join us on them. It's just, uh, yeah, what Freelancer said. All right, so I'm actually turning off the stream now. Thanks, everybody, for watching. This has been great, and it was good to talk to you. And we'll see you again next week. Remember, feedback at TalesOfTeria.com. And if you feel like it, subscribe to us on YouTube, Sound Strategy Network. Thank you very much.